Okay, today we plan to go through Philippians chapter 1, verses 19 through 26. In today's passage, Paul reflects on life. Why are we alive? What's our purpose? What's the meaning of life? And Paul reflects on death. What's the meaning of death? Should we be afraid of death as believers? Should we be afraid of it? In this passage, Paul shares frankly about these hugely important questions. Here's some background. The Apostle Paul is writing to the Philippians. That's a Roman colony in modern day Greece. He's expressing his thanks to them for their support. He has assured them of his constant prayers. He's always praying for them. And he has brought his readers up to date regarding his Roman imprisonment, probably the imprisonment from Acts chapter 28. Even though the overall imprisonment process has not been easy, Paul is still full of joy, full of joy in the midst of it. The circumstances cannot bring him down. Now Paul reflects upon what he senses the future holds. And in the process, he shares freely about his purpose in life and about what death will bring or would bring. So please stand. We're going to pray and ready our hearts for the word. And then we'll read through the whole passage and then we'll sit and we'll just take it in as far as verse by verse. Father, I thank you for this passage we're about to read. I pray that you'd speak to us and Lord, that we'd have hearts to listen and hear and obey and submit ourselves to you, Lord. Lord, teach us about life. Teach us about death. Lord, you know all things and you share freely with us all things, Lord, in your word. And we just thank you, Lord. I pray, Father, for uh, humble hearts and teachable hearts. And we commit this whole time to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Hebrews chapter 1, verses 19 through 26. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. According to my earnest expectation and hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed. But with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit for my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell. For I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. Please be seated. There's a lot here. It's a very profound passage. The entire Bible's profound, but this has a, an incredible focus of uh, profoundness. So we're going to look at five insights into Paul's life and followed by three reflections. And the reflections have to do with a purpose and uh, death and various reflections. So insight number one. Out of five insights, uh, Paul's confidence. We see Paul's confidence in verse 19, for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. So Paul's confident that he will be delivered from his suffering. Based on the following verses, what follows this, either he'll be delivered out of prison so that he can continue in life, or he'll be delivered out of his body so that he can be with Christ. Either way, he's going to be delivered. The source of his confidence comes from the prayers that are being offered on his behalf and from the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus Christ. He says again, for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and through the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. His confidence is rooted in prayer and rooted in the Holy Spirit. Insight number two, Paul's hope. Verse 20, according to my earnest expectation and hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. 
So Paul speaks of his earnest expectation and hope. Really interesting uh, phrase there. The term earnest expectation means strained expectancy. It has to do with keen anticipation of the future. The whole idea of stretching one's neck to see what lies ahead. You know, that's essentially the term he's using. Paul's hope is that Christ will be magnified while in his body, whether he continues on this side of eternity or transitions to the other side. The word magnified means enlarged, made great, declared great, exalted. So, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body here in verse 20. Either way, he does not expect to be ashamed by his conduct in life or by his appearing before Christ. Either way, rather he expects to move forward with all boldness according to this verse. He will boldly magnify Christ in his life and he will boldly appear before Christ in his death. Either way, he'll be unashamed and he'll be bold. It's clear that Paul has no fear of death, none at all. Insight number three, Paul's purpose. Verse 21, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So Paul's bottom line purpose is to live for Christ. To live for Christ. The whole idea of this, it boils down to Jesus Christ. Our life boils down to Christ. He gave us life spiritual life, and we'll have physical life as far as on the other side, we'll have wonderful new bodies. He gave us life, and in a sense, he lives through us. So in response, we live for him completely. That's what we do. So for, for me, to, for, to me, to live as Christ is what he's saying, to live as Christ. Paul is not living to get the most toys in life. He's not living to get the most friends in life. He's not living to get the most success in life. And he's not living to get the most pleasure in life. Rather, he's living for Christ. That's what he is all in for. All in. He's living for Christ. And when he dies, he wins. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. He will see Christ face to face. Thus, to die is gain. He loses nothing of eternal value in the transition from this side of eternity to the other side of eternity. Rather, he gains. He loses nothing and he gains. Insight number four, Paul's dilemma, verses 22 and 23. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit for my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell, for I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. So Paul's dilemma is this. If I continue to live in my physical body, I will continue to bear fruit. To live is Christ. As long as I'm alive, I will magnify him. But if I die, I go to be with the Lord. To die is gain. It's gain. So departing and being with Christ is, he says, far better. Literally in the Greek, it says, very much more better. Very much more better. That's what he's saying. It's a whole lot better to depart and be with Christ. So Paul is torn. What I shall choose, I cannot tell. They're both great paths, wonderful paths. He declares that he's hard pressed between the two. John MacArthur says this, he said, the Greek word for hard pressed, pictures a narrow path, a rock wall on either side, allowing him to only go straight ahead. He's sort of hard pressed on both sides. It's really God's call as far as what's gonna happen in his life. He knows it's not really his choice. So insight number five, Paul's conclusion. So we look so far at Paul's confidence, his hope, his purpose, his dilemma, and now a final insight, Paul's conclusion, verses 24 to 26. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. 
And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. So Paul is stating that if he remains in his body, it will be better for the Philippians, for his readers. And then he declares with confidence that God is going to have him remain in the body. As the Holy Spirit showing him that that's the path that God is choosing for him. So God's going to have him remain in the body. Paul is going to continue to help his readers grow in their faith journey. And this path will bring his readers the most joy, more abundant rejoicing, according to this verse 26. And obviously he believes that it will bring God the most glory. It will magnify Christ the most, as far as that's the path that God will have for him. Here are some reflection points. Three reflection points that we're going to look at, and we'll spend most of our time here. Reflection point number one, purpose. Paul's purpose is Christ. He lives to magnify Christ, to bring him glory. He lives to bear fruit. He desires to help the Philippians grow in their faith. He lives to make disciples. He lives to be used by God to bring God glory, to further the church, to further God's purposes, to be used by God, to be an instrument in the hands of God. Matthew 28, verses 18 and 19. Jesus gives us the Great Commission. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. We're all called to take part in that, to make disciples of all nations, to live as Christ. We live to magnify him, and we magnify him by making disciples of all nations. God wants to use us to further his kingdom, to share Christ with others who desperately need to hear they need to hear what Jesus has done on the cross for them. It's not just, here's Jesus and he'll, do, he'll give you a better life. He'll help you to be happier. That's not the main point. The main point is he paid for your sins. So you can know God personally and you can have everlasting life. He didn't die so our finances could be a little bit better or maybe our job could go a little bit better or our marriage could be a little bit better. He didn't die for that reason. All those things are true for a believer in Christ. He gives us grace to bring him glory in whatever sphere we're in. But he died ultimately to bring us into relationship with God the Father through God the Son. So that's purpose, our purpose, and his purpose and our purpose. There are many in Scripture who are living for things other than Christ other than bearing fruit, other than the Great Commission. And their lives are rather tragic. Scripture gives us a number of examples. The rich young ruler is living for riches. Thus, he is saddened by Jesus. Remember Jesus, what he said? Hey, go, give everything to the poor, and then come follow me. And Scripture says he went away sad. He didn't like that. He didn't like that at all. That was his security system. He went away sad. King Herod, he's living for power. Thus, he is threatened by Jesus. He hears of another king. Who's this king who was born? He tries to wipe out all the kids who are two and less. He's, so his whole time frame involved. And so huge heartache as far as the slaughter of innocent babies, infants, because he was threatened. He didn't want his power to be threatened. He surely didn't want to get in trouble with Rome. And he lived for power. Sad. Many of the Gentiles of their day and of our day are living for pleasure. Thus, they are disinterested in Jesus. It's like, he's not going to help my party to go any better. He's not going to help us to have a more fun Friday night, Saturday night. And for me, it used to be a lot of nights. And it's like, he's not going to help me have more fun. He's not going to help me experience more pleasure. 
So it doesn't apply to my life. I was like, that's sad. That's really sad. May God wake people up. And I'm so fortunate he woke me up that a life of partying is no fun in the long run. It's not doing what God has called us to do. He wants us to touch the eternal in our lives. He doesn't want us to just be here, be a blip of time, and have some fun in the process and then go away, having no impact on eternity and no relationship with God. That's a sad picture. The Pharisees also, they, they tend to be living for earned spiritual status. Thus, they're repulsed by Jesus, who undermines their religious system. They were big on the religious system. They knew how to play the game. They knew how to look good, the flowing robes and, and um, determining what is right and wrong based on the law, the Jewish law. And they were missing the whole boat. They were missing it. So they were repulsed, and thus they were... They wanted very much him to be dead. They wanted very much for him to be crucified. And the Romans ended up being somewhat reluctant, and yet in the end, they willingly did it. Or shall we say, unwillingly got tricked into doing it. But either way. Uh, so what are we living for? Something that's here today and gone tomorrow? Or something that's long-lasting? God wants us to live for that which is long-lasting, like faith in Christ, like living for Christ, like helping other people grow in Christ, like teaching little kids, loud kids, about faith in Christ, and teaching our kids, teaching our grandkids about faith in Christ, being an example, cultivating godly character, the fruit of the Spirit, the love and the joy and the peace and the patience, the kindness, those kinds of things speak volumes to those around us who are looking to see, is this thing really real, this thing called Christianity? Is it really real? And some may scoff and others are very curious behind the scenes. So that's purpose. Uh, reflection number one is purpose. Reflection number two, power. Reflection number two, power. Paul does not draw his power from willpower or from talent or from charisma or from self-help. I'd be real surprised if he would have gone to your average how to get ahead kind of class and would have been reading those kinds of books. This is what you have to do to dress for success. To be the best apostle you can be, you need to wear this, you need to do that, you need to have a charisma, you need to make sure when you speak you use the right technique. He wasn't into that. He was into the power of God, the raw power of God. In verse 19, we see that Paul is drawing power from prayer and from the Holy Spirit. That's what he mentions in verse 19 alone. Prayer is powerful because it involves access to God's power. If we have a prayerless life, we have a weak life. A prayerful life, and we'll have a much stronger life. In our weakness, we become strong. As God says, I've been waiting for you to lay it all out to me. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 9, Jesus says this, Ask, and it'll be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it'll be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. So Jesus encourages us to persistently ask. God loves to give good things. Just like a parent loves to give good things to the kid who asks. And God loves to give good things to his children, his sons and daughters in the faith. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18, we've visited this many times recently. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So God's will to, to rejoice constantly, to pray without ceasing, the sense of ongoing prayer, and in everything to give thanks. This is God's will for us. What's God's will for me? Well, 
it's often to learn character is often more important than the setting that God uses to develop the character in. So we're to pray without ceasing, ongoing prayer, ongoing reliance, ongoing relationship with God. Yesterday at the men's meeting, we talked about, it was, it was brought up during the meeting as far as ACTS, the acronym for, it sort of captures prayer. And again, it's an acronym, it's a human acronym, but it's actually very insightful. ACTS, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication or asking. That's what prayer is all about, adoring God, confessing our sins, thanking him, and then supplication, asking him for things. And so he wants us to have a strong prayer life and to pray without ceasing. So Paul's strength is coming from prayer and from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is powerful because we're drawing directly from divine strength. So prayer is powerful and the Holy Spirit is powerful and they work hand in hand. So in Zechariah chapter four, verse six, the prophet is given these words by God, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. So God himself is speaking this to the prophet. It takes the power of the Holy Spirit to accomplish the works of God. And there was a big work that the people had to do, and it was the power of the Holy Spirit that was going to enable them to do that which God was directing them to do. We cannot do things in our own strength. We need the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, Paul says this, Do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, it's a waste, but be filled with the Spirit. So instead of being filled with substances, we're to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. This is an ongoing yielding, an ongoing enablement. The Holy Spirit indwells the heart of every believer. There's an indwelling that takes place at the time of salvation. Our sins are forgiven and the Holy Spirit says, finally, I can come into your heart because the sins have been forgiven. And yet then we're, we're encouraged to yield ourselves and to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And it's an ongoing kind of thing. It's not even just a one-time shot, as awesome as it is to have a baptism or a, a wonderful uh, immersion of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Don't stop there. <laughs> it's an ongoing thing. Be filled and constantly filled with the Holy Spirit. And we need that. Without prayer and without the power of the Holy Spirit, we can so easily get burned out, can't we? You ever experience that? Or you just feel like, oh man, I'm putting all sorts of effort in and I feel like I'm burning out a little bit because we lack the right power source. We need the right power source in order to continue on. The ever ready aspect of our life, we need prayer. We need the Holy Spirit, two essentials. Remember Mary and Martha, the two sisters from Bethany. Mary was sitting at Jesus' feet, listening to him and drawing from him. Well, Martha was busy, but not drawing upon Christ. It's not a sin to be busy, but she was not drawing upon Christ for strength. Thus, she had a bad attitude, a complaining attitude, a comparing attitude. Jesus, tell my sister to help out. <laughs> and Jesus said, she chosen the better path. And so let's be like Mary, just empowered by the Lord. Not like Martha, who's busy and busy, but sort of disconnected from Christ at that time. If he's right there, we really need to be sitting at his feet. And in our lives, he's always with us. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. So in some ways, let's go around life sitting at the feet of Christ. We're called to remain connected to Christ, to abide in him, to dwell in him. And in that relationship is peace and strength and joy. The power we need to live this life. It's an impossible life to live the Christian life. That's why we need the Lord to do it through us. Who can develop self-control without the Holy Spirit helping us? 
who can develop patience without the Holy Spirit enabling us? Who can really share the word of life that changes hearts? Who can do the changing of hearts? We can't do it ourselves. It's the Holy Spirit who does it in the lives of those around us. So reflection number two was power. Reflection number three is death. Paul is not afraid of death. This is a huge theme in this passage. In verse 21, to live is Christ and to die is gain. There's no fear and there's no anxiety. Isn't that something? That alone is enough to attract people around us. It's like, tell me about this hope that you have. And they're trying to figure out, are you crazy? Or are you, is this something that is real? So people who have genuine faith in Christ have nothing to be afraid of. In fact, they can actually look forward to death in some ways looking forward to it. The pain is gone, the disease is gone, and the suffering is gone. They'll be given a new body with no inner desire to resist God, no flesh. And flesh being that sinful nature, that part of us that still wars against God. Even for a Christian, there's still a battle between flesh and spirit, the old man and the new man. And they'll be in perfect fellowship with Christ absolutely perfect fellowship on the other side of eternity. Without genuine faith, a person often fears death and should fear death. They really should, because the prospect of paying for one's own sins is horrifying. To think about that is horrifying. Where a person without genuine faith may ignore death altogether, may act like it's not a reality. It has no bearing on my life. I'm going to ignore it. Or a person without genuine faith may become preoccupied with death, either living on the edge, always defying death. That's somehow excitement. We were talking about motorcycles yesterday. It's an interesting aspect of motorcycles that are like, whoa, especially those who go fast and weave in and out. It's like, what are you doing? Weaving in and out of a highway. So some are living on the edge, almost defying death, or living in the occult, being fascinated by death, somehow very interested in it. It's like, that's not the right way to go. It doesn't satisfy, it doesn't meet the need that we have. Genuine believers throughout Scripture face death with boldness. Jacob had no fear of death as he blessed his sons in Genesis chapter 49. Remember, he blessed each one. And right before that, he was blessing Joseph's sons, and he switches his arms. He does the switcheroo thing. This whole sovereignty of God is throughout Genesis and throughout the Bible. But it's like, I'm sovereignly choosing the younger to be the greater. It's like, isn't that something? So Jacob, no fear of death. The prophets had no fear of death as they were persecuted for telling the truth. And some were sawn in two. And some were killed in other ways, or they were placed into a cistern like Jeremiah and a miry pit, and just the suffering that they dealt with. Stephen in the New Testament had no fear of death as he was being stoned for his faith in Christ. He had no fear of death. He said, I see Jesus right there, and he's standing, like almost applauding Stephen's faith. And so he wasn't scared. In fact, he was so full of peace at that time. It must have befuddled those who were there. Apparently the Apostle Paul was there, or who became the Apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus, was there obviously impacted by it. The Apostles had no fear of death as they boldly proclaimed Christ. They weren't intimidated by the Romans or by the Jewish leaders. They were not intimidated at all. And here, in this passage, Paul has no fear of death as he looks it in the eye with anticipation. To die is gain. It's gain. I lose nothing. So death. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 55. Very interesting what he has to say. Oh, death, 
where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? So death will have lost its sting like a hornet without a stinger. In fact, it already has lost its sting, basically. When I was in Atlanta, I got swarmed by burrowing yellow jackets. Remember that, hon? Oh, yeah, she remembers. There were at least 23 stings, and they were under my shirt. It was like, oh, yeah. I was pondering some landscaping improvements, and they were burrowing, and they were actually in the, in the dirt. And all of a sudden, it's like, ow, 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 ow. And I got up, and I started running, and they were all just like laughing at me because they were under my shirt. So they can run as fast as you want, but we have no problem just stinging you. And so it was just nasty. Plus, I couldn't run as fast as they could fly. And I remember there was one evil, very evil yellow jacket, and it, it circled me. And it was one of those weird situations where it circled me, and then it went right for me. And it was almost like slow motion. It got me right in the lip. And it's like, you nasty little yellow jacket. <laughs> and my whole face swelled up. And we went to Northside Hospital. And I was said to be like a gargoyle, you know, a gargoyle kind of look. It was like, whoa. <laughs> you know, some of those interesting art kinds of pictures, that was me. And so, <laughs> so my face swelled up. They sent me to the hospital. It was nasty. Just think, if these yellow jackets had had no stingers, then there'd be no danger. I could laugh at them. You can do all you want. You're going to dive bomb me, and you're just going to bounce off. And it's like, no problem, oh, yellow jacket. No problem. Well, death has lost its stinger. That's what Christ did. He basically made that possible for the stinger to be lost. Verses 56 and 57. These are the two verses after the, O oh, death, where is your sting? And again, this is written by Paul. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So the sting of death is sin. Death's lethal stinger is sin. But sin has been dealt with. The price tag of our sin has been paid the strength of sin is the law, it says here in verse 56. So the Old Testament law defines sin. The Ten Commandments and all the Old Testament law together defines sin. It demands blood, ultimately, for violations of the law. But the law has been fulfilled in Christ. He kept the law in every way. He was without sin in every way. So the price tag for sin has been paid in full. And he says, but thanks be to God. So we're so thankful to God, incredibly thankful, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He's given us victory over sin and death. Our sins have been paid for, so death is no longer final. It's no longer final. Our victory is through Jesus Christ. It's not through self-help programs. It's not through self human initiated effort in any way or human effort in any way but it's through the Lord Jesus Christ the word for Lord means supreme in authority he's number one as far as all the authorities of the world all the authorities of the universe he's number one he's number one he works hand in hand with God the Father he only submits to God the Father and so he's Lord over all. So here's the big picture. Adam and Eve were created to live forever with no death. That was the original creation. But they sinned. And that very same day, they internalized sin. They came to no sin. And it was no in the sense of Adam knew Eve. In other words, intimacy with sin. So they internalized sin, and they died spiritually that day and began to die physically. Decay entered in. The death process began. What Jesus, the second Adam, did was to flip the script. That's exactly what he did. He took humanity's sin upon himself. Since he had no sin, he could pay for our sin, your sin, my sin. Each one of us, he paid for our sin. 
So when a person believes in Christ, that very same day, he or she comes alive spiritually. Just like they died spiritually that day they sinned, we come alive spiritually the day we receive Christ. We're alive spiritually. And then we look forward to a new physical body as well. Just as Adam and Eve, they, they died spiritually that day and they began to die as far as the death process. Death was going to be part of their experience. The decay was going to be part of their experience. For us, we come alive in Christ when we come to faith in him and we look forward to that new body as well. It is going to be a physical thing as well as spiritual. So we look forward to that. At the point of death or the return of Christ, whichever comes first, we get new bodies. New bodies with no cancer, new bodies that laugh at COVID, new bodies that never have ailments, <laughs> no illness, no leukemia, no anything. We are, we become we, we get we, we receive perfect bodies, perfect bodies, and they will never die. People pay money to extend their lives. We've got the promise of eternity with no problems as far as physically. For the believer in Jesus Christ, death has lost its sting. It hasn't been fully rolled out yet. We still die physically but we will be given new bodies on the other side. So death has lost its sting. One final thing is, here are some of the highlights regarding the eternal state for believers. What we have to look forward to as far as the last two chapters of Scripture, Revelation 21 and 22, and what our eternal state will look like for believers. No more tears, no more crying. No more death, no more sorrow, no more pain. All things will be new. The streets will be pure gold, and that's something. Here we have problems as far as potholes. No potholes. So the streets will be pure gold. There will be no temple, because God Almighty and the Lamb, Jesus, will be its temple. They'll be the temple. There's no sun or moon because the glory of God and the Lamb are its light. Isn't that something? No solar eclipses. No weird prophecies regarding, supposed prophecies regarding solar eclipses. From the throne of God and of the Lamb will be a pure river of the water of life. On either side of the river will be the tree of life, a tree that we haven't seen since the fall of humanity, since the garden. It's back. The leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. There shall be no more curse. God's servants shall serve him. Well, the privilege of serving the Lord directly. God's servants shall see his face. We'll see the Lord as far as face to face. His name shall be on their foreheads, our foreheads. With no sun, the Lord God will provide the light. God's servants in service to God and to the Lamb will reign forever and ever. So we're serving him and somehow reigning with him forever and ever. That's all in Revelation 21 and 22. With an eternal future like this, how can we not cry out with the same cry that we see in Revelation 22 that says, come, Lord Jesus, come. And death, you've lost your sting. To die is gain. It's gain. John is not afraid of death. Paul is not afraid of death. And we need not be afraid of death either. So after we die, there is the millennial kingdom. And time permitting, I'd love to also mention some of that. 
But that's what comes next. And then comes the eternal state, but we flash forward to the eternal state, the beginning of Scripture, the end of Scripture. But we'll talk in the, about the millennial kingdom in the future. And wouldn't that be fun? As far as Jesus coming back, this is an election year. No scandals, no nasty stuff. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> so personal application. Questions we ask as we ponder this passage. What are you and I living for? Is it temporary or long-lasting? Does it bring glory to self or glory to God? Is there any specific focus that God may be leading us to take on in the context of making disciples of all nations, in the context of magnifying the Lord? Regarding power, are we walking in spiritual power? Or are we getting burned out? Are we drawing power from prayer? If not, why not? Are we too busy to pray? Are we too self-reliant to pray? Are we too skeptical to pray? We're not sure if it really matters. Is there a new chapter of prayer that the Lord may be leading us into? A brand new chapter. If so, let's enjoy the journey. Let's walk with the Lord in the new chapter he has, he may have for us. And then are we drawing power from the reliance, from reliance on the Holy Spirit? If not, why not? Again, are we too self-reliant? Are we too unaware of spiritual realities? Are we too afraid to trust in the Spirit of God? Are we thinking, hey, I already had my Holy Spirit ex experience. I don't really need anything new and fresh. It's like, nah, you haven't had enough. We need more. Is there a new chapter of walking in the Spirit that the Lord may be leading us into? If so, are we willing? And then regarding death. Are you and I being hampered by a fear of death in any way? Are we willing to search the scriptures to cultivate a boldness regarding death? The same kind of boldness that Paul had and other greats of scripture had. Are we looking forward to our new bodies and to seeing Christ face to face? Are we looking forward to the eternal state? No more tears, no more sorrow, no more death. Are we living our lives in light of our eternal destiny, saying no to the sins of the flesh because they're not fitting for where we're going to end up. They're not fitting. Saying yes to the Spirit's promptings and venturing to walk with Christ wherever he leads us, being used by God to touch eternity on a day-by-day -day basis. And finally, are we growing in our desire for Christ's return? Come, Lord Jesus. Come. Lord, I thank you for this time in your word. And Lord, thank you for these reminders to live wholeheartedly for you, to walk in the power that you provide, to stand strong even in the face of death. Lord, for anyone who has yet to receive you, Lord Jesus, may that person's yearning for hope, bring that person to his or her knees. May a desire for hope bring that person to a point of surrender. I surrender all. Receiving you, the Lord Jesus Christ, by faith, saying, Lord, I need you. I can't do it myself. And I want to know Father God, and I want to know God the Son. And so I repent of my sins. I turn from them. I turn from a self-centered life. And I receive you, Lord Jesus Christ, into my life, into my heart. And I live for you. You're my Savior and you're my Lord. I thank you, Lord, for this time in your word. Do your work, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.